Okay, so hi, I'm Mario, I'm a PhD student from the University of Potsdam. And I will talk about metaprogramming algorithm which solves a specific problem in um, numerical methods. And this is actually an implementation detail of the Odeon library I was working on with uh, Carsten, who's also here. So we gave a talk on the library on Monday. Um, and well, I know that some people have been there, some have not. But this is actually, uh, um, can be understood unrelated to, to the library. It's an implementation detail of these algorithms. And OK, so that's the outline. I will start introducing ordinary differential equations. I've been giving this talk already to a completely different audience, namely um, mathematicians and physicists. And there, the first point was actually meta programming and templates. So I've switched that to the differential equations here because I assume everyone knows about meta programming. OK, then I will introduce the numerical scheme we are going to um, implement. And then finally, uh, what we have done. And I will conclude with some performance results and a short summary. Uh, one note. Um, so this is not number crunching at compile time. Actually, when I was uh, proposing this to this conference, I got a little feedback. Oh, wow, number crunching at compile time. How can I say no to that or something like that? OK, so it's not number crunching at compile time. I'm sorry. Lies. <laughs> yeah, so everyone's in the this time. OK, so um, what are ordinary differential equations? Uh, they are mathematical objects that describe basically anything. Um, OK, differential equations are mathematical objects that describe basically anything in physics, chemistry, biology, social science. So any kind of process you can, dynamical process you can imagine is basically described as a differential equation. Ordinary differential equation is a subset. Um, there are partial differential equations and several others. Uh, actually, I stole this slide from the Monday presentation. Uh, so we have several examples, Newton's equations, um, interacting neurons, and, well, lots of things. Okay, so uh, mathematically, if you take into account a first order ordinary differential equation, it has this form. So you have the time derivative of some function x of t equals some other function f, which depends on the function it itself, and might depend on t also. And what you're trying to get, so the solution would be the function x of t, which I would call trajectory. It doesn't have to be one, but um, as a physicist, this is mostly a trajectory. t um, is the in independent variable, which I will always call time here, but it doesn't have to be, but just for simplicity. And then there's the right hand side, it's the f, depending on x and t, and this is what defines your ordinary differential equation. And then connected to a differential equation, you have typically initial value problems. That means you have, on one hand, the differential equation, x dot equals f of x and t, and also an initial value. So Let's say at time zero, I know my pendulum is at this position. And then I want to solve it. OK, some <coughs> explicit examples. Uh, so the first one is just um, well, basically the most simple one-dimensional ODE you can think of. It's x dot equals minus lambda x, and you can solve that analytically. It just gives you an exponential. Uh, the second one is the... Uh, Harmonic oscillator, it has a second order time derivative, so this is not a first order ODE, but you can always transform higher order differential equations to first order by introducing new variables in a very trivial way. So we introduce a P, and then you see we have two differential equations, the first one is trivial, the second one represents the former second order. 
And for this, you can also write down the explicit solution. Analytically, it's just a sign. Okay, if it gets more complicated, um, we have to switch to numerical methods. And one of the most famous examples, at least in my field, which is uh, nonlinear dynamics, is the Lorentz system. It's a three. It's a system of three di differential equations of the following form, and it's known to be chaotic, at least for some parameter values, and that means you have no chance of writing down the analytical solution. It just you can't express it in, in some sine functions or anything because it's chaotic. In this case, the only <coughs> chance to get the solution is to apply some numerical algorithms and then to get an approximate trajectory that um, represents a real solution of this system. Okay, that's where we need numerical methods. And that's uh, what I'm doing every day in my research. I have to solve a differential equation. Okay, so there's one big class of algorithms which do that. They are the so-called Murakuta schemes and schemes, and that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in the next few slides. Okay, so what? Uh, so how do they work? Okay, first of all, you introduce a time discretization. So instead of um, having a continuous time, you go to time steps, Tn, which are um, basically some starting time T0, and then uh, just H is a time step, and then N t T0 plus N times H are your discrete points in time. And then these Omakuta schemes can calculate the, <coughs> the, the tra trajectory at these um, discrete time points. And what you do basically is you start at x0, and then you iterate to x1, and then you take that, iterate further to x2, and so on and so on. <coughs> so the wunger kutter schemes are one-step methods. That means uh, your approximate solution at the next step depends only on the previous step. So x1 is a function of x0, and x2 is a function of just x1. So you don't have um, to take previous results, only the, the exact previous results into account and not uh, the ones before. Okay, so that's roughly illustrated in this graph. So the black line would be your exact solution if you could um, solve it analytically. And what these scheme, schemes do is to iterate um, an approximate solution, x1, x2, and so on. Okay, so the, you get an error, of course, I exaggerated here, but you would try to get it as small as possible, of course. I was just going to ask if your error accumulates. Yes, exactly, it, it does. Right. Because you always take the last result as your new starting point, and then, of course. So you have to make sure it's small enough. Right. Okay, so um, let's uh, step deeper into these Mongolkota schemes. Again, you have your differential equation and as an initial value problem. Then each Mongolkota scheme has a number of stages. I call this S, the number. It has a set of parameters. One are C1 to CS, so it's S parameters of C, and then you have a bunch of A's and a bunch of B's, and these parameters define your own protesting. I will come back to that in a moment. And then to calculate one step of your um, solution, you have to do the following computations. So the X1 is given by a sum over intermediate results f, and these intermediate results are calculated as, on the right hand side, the important point here is that for each new f, 
you need all the Fs before, which is represented as this sum here, which goes from the first to the current term. Okay, and then each Volkuta scheme has also an order, which is um, which defines the convergence if I uh, take the limit of h going to zero. But okay, that's not the concern of the implementation, it's mathematical properties. Okay, so what do you have to do at each stage of your Volkuta scheme? You first have to evaluate your function. And you plug in a current intermediate approximation. And then if you have this function yet evaluated, you can calculate the next approximation of your trajectory. Well, it's not the result of your approximation. It's a temporary approximation within your Omeguta step. OK, and you do this as times. And then if you are ready, with that, you can calculate the full solution using all the intermediate function evaluations you have obtained. Okay. And you see that here in these formulas you have all the parameters, the C's, the A's, um, and the B's appearing. And these parameters define the Monokota scheme. So if you give me a set of parameters, I can calculate a Monokota step. So this is um, usually written as a so-called factual tableau. And you see it's just um, a way of organizing the parameters. And this way is pretty nice because each line in this tableau represents one stage of your factual tableau. So the third, third stage is, um, can be calculated by knowing C3 and these two values of A. Okay, so if, if you have this tableau, then your Hunger-Kutta scheme is completely defined. There's no more you have to know. I was going to ask if the, the, F, the F sub i, the, the intermediate values, do you have to recalculate all of those every, for every step? Or are they the A's? The F sub i? No, 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 you should store them. Okay. Sure, yeah. I, so I, you get, I, you I, get couldn't they, I couldn't see if they varied on the, no, on no, the no, time no. step, right? Yeah. So you use this, you get you use this, you get F1, then in the next line you get F2 by using F1. Here you get F3 by using F1 and F2. So you can just pre-calculate that whole thing. Well, but the F dep depends on your function. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so now trivial implementation of this algorithm will look like this. I think it's pretty obvious what, what's happening. So you evaluate your function. you calculate intermediate results, evaluate your function using this intermediate result, and so on until uh, you finally get your solution. So this is perfectly nice. This is what is done in numerical recipes, for example, as an Omeguta implementation, or in the GSL, which is the scientific library. So this is the standard way to implement it. It's um, fast and everything. The problem is just if you write a library and you want like six Monokota <coughs> schemes, you start with the same code all over and we know we can do better. Okay, so you can write the generic implementation which uses not uh, template programming but just um, runtime Generacy, so to say, so you uh, use the parameters as arrays, dynamically sized, and you would write a for loop over the stages, and then each stage gets calculated, and the, at the end, you calculate your final solution. This is um, actually implemented like this in um, the Apache Math Java library, so they have also generic Monokota um, scheme, which is implemented exactly in this way. So it's runtime generic. So Java scientific library or something? It's Java, uh, no, it's Apache, Commons, Math, something like that. Yeah, so it's open source and 
It's pretty nicely uh, designed and everything, but it's Java. Yes. Uh, are there ways to generically parallelize that, that algorithm? So is there some parallelization possible? or? Uh, um, the problem here is that each new step depends on the result of the previous step. Okay. So we have parallelization. Um, and it's possible, but it does not parallelize this algorithm. It parallelizes um, large sets of ODEs. Okay. So let's say you have 1,000 ODEs, which is not that uncommon, actually. Mm -hmm. If you have some ledger system or anything, then you can parallelize over this. So you just fan out the, the... Exactly. As long as you don't have inter interdependencies between those. Yeah, and I mean the interdependencies enter usually at the F, at the right-hand side. You stare, you usually have couplings between the sides. So um, you have to do each intermediate step, you have to do a synchronization after each intermediate step. Okay. But I don't know how it would be possible to parallelize the algorithm itself, because you always need the previous result. Well, I, I know how to do it. Okay. We can talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I would be happy to do that. I mean, I'm fine with parallelizing over large sets because that's <coughs> actually what I'm doing, and their parallelization is quite efficient. Okay. And I completely so neglect. I completely neglect this, this problem on. Uh, exactly the same. Vector value is not vector value input here, so I, I'm only dealing with one D or E because that's more simple. Okay, so if you do this in C++. You get um, implementation which is about a factor of two slower than the direct implementation. So that you can't um, you can't do it because it just kills you. I mean, you don't want to be a factor two slower. What 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 makes it slower is it is the algorithm fundamentally different or is it the, no 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 the, the it's cache, exactly the, the same cache kind of access. I I control. have I have no I don't really know why it's the case. Yes, maybe the loops. Yeah, well, yeah, I, this is exactly the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so why is the performance better? Of course, you should um, uh, try to get it. If you want to try to get it fast, you have to um, identify the, the problem. And what I think might be the case is you have um, a double for loop. If you go into here, you see you have the loop over the stages. And at each stage, you have the loop which sums up all the intermediate previous results. And the inner loop is even depending on the outer loop variable. So that's, I don't know much about optimizers, but I can imagine that that's nasty. Okay. And also if you define your parameter values, uh, you basically have to do it dynamically because each um, A each line of A has a different number of values in it. So uh, what I've been playing around and trying to get this fast, and uh, I couldn't do it. So, um, and these are the two things I think are uh, responsible. Maybe the first one is the most more important. Uh, but okay, I'm not sure. I don't know much about optimizers. I just can say what I observed. Okay, so uh, how can we solve that? And of course, <coughs> we can use um, template metaprogramming to uh, generate code that's more efficient and can be better optimized on by the compiler. And so there are two things we do. First of all, we um, generate the fixed, we generate the A's as fixed size arrays. And secondly, we will unroll the for loop, which goes over the stages um, at compile time. So hopefully, we end up with code that it's better optimizable by the compiler and by the optimizer. Okay, so um, I will show you a major program that creates these Funakuta schemes. The input will be the parameters of the scheme, which is this, this budget tuple. And well, the 
most important thing is it should be as fast as if I would implement it directly. And if you do so, you have uh, <coughs> some benefits. First of all, you don't start writing each Fungokuta scheme from scratch. You just plug in the parameters and you're fine. Which means if this meta program is correct, you have less bugs in your code and it's also uh, better maintainable. Okay, so we start with um, representing one stage of the Monokuta scheme by uh, some C++ in Taiti, which is a struct and it just has two members. One is the parameter C and the other one is the array that holds the A values. And the template parameter <coughs> is the current stage number. And if I have one instance of this stage, I can calculate one uh, stage of the Bonaparte scheme. And this is done in this function, so this function gets <coughs> not actually what's in the code, but to uh, demonstrate how this is done. So you get an instance of such a stage, and then, okay, you first have to check if it's the first stage, because that's a little bit different. And you have to check if that's the last stage, because it's also a little bit different. At the first stage, you don't read intermediate value, you read the x directly. In the last stage, you don't write um, intermediate value, you write the result. Yes? I may be wrong, but you're checking the, the stage value at runtime, but could, can you... Well, that gets optimized away. Okay. I mean, I as the template parameter and the if clause do you don't have to actually put it in different like specializations. You can just assume the optimizer is yeah. effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can do specializations, but I think the optimizer would can handle that because the I is actually it's known. It's known. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, if you don't believe that, you can put specializations. <laughs> but I did it this way. Check the example. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then now here's the meta programming part. Uh, so you have to generate the sequence of these stages and we used MPL and we um, transform the result to a fusion vector because we actually need instances. Okay. Well, usually I say it, you will not understand this at the mock conferences, but here there might be actually people who do. Um, the point is you will get um, a fusion vector which has exactly the structure we want. So you get a fusion vector which uh, consists of stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on until stage S. Because they're not filled with anything, right? No, this is just a type. Yeah. Exactly. And then um, we uh, derive from that and uh, supply a constructor that actually fills in the values. Okay, I will not. I'm not showing how this is done, but it's not difficult. I mean, it's standard template meta. Okay, then you have these types for A, B, and C. The type for B and C are, are trivial. It's just arrays of size S. The type for A, again, you use some meta programming to get a fusion vector of array of size 1, 2, 3, and so on, until S. So this represents the types uh, of A, B, and C, how they are put into the algorithm. Okay, and here already you might um, get better performance because you have fixed size errors instead of dynamically sized. Okay, then um, the Roman Kutta step is performed as a fusion for each over a vector of these stages over an instance of the stage vector. And <coughs> Well, the fusion for each just calls um, this cut uh, stage caller, and then basically the function I was showing you before gets executed. The point here is that this fusion for each is unrolled at compile time. So what uh, the compiler after the template specialization sees is a sequential code of these cut stage routines, and this should give better. Uh, possibility to, to optimize code. Okay, then we put the whole thing into some mm, usable interface. So 
we call it a generic rule kutta, and it gets as a, in a constructor it gets all the parameters, and then it has a two-step method uh, where you put in your system, which is the right-hand side function. It gets the current state. Um, some time it gets uh, some state where it should write the result into and the time step. And all it does is basically calling this for each and applying the stages. Okay, this, I'm not even sure if this is complete, but I just want to show the interface. So you have this two step method which basically does the step. Okay, now um, let me show you an example and the performance of that. So uh, this is the most, this is, well, yeah, the most used Fumakuta scheme. It's the Fumakuta 4 algorithm. It's, I don't know, 50 years old. And still be used and it's very basic, but it works in almost all cases. So it's the typical thing you would test. The budget triple looks like that. And this is how you would implement this specific scheme using the generic Fumakuta I showed you before. So you generate the three arrays for A, you make them a fusion major, and then you put a, the A's, B's, and C's into the constructor, and then you can call the do step. Why, yes. why do you need the double curly brace? Uh, maybe I don't need it. Okay. Okay, not that. I think you don't. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, it's maybe my convention that it is. I think you do. Really? I mean, you have an array and you have the, the elements also right inside, so you have to separate to specify. Right. Okay, then. Oh, okay, no. You're yeah. right. It's yeah, because you're just, right. Yeah. Okay, maybe, uh, yeah. sorry. C++ plus plus with 3, you have to do this. No. Yeah. I'm not I, sure about C++ plus plus 11, maybe you can. I think 11, it should be just okay, direct yeah, initialization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's actually, it's, we wanted to compile on O3. Okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay so um, now we look at the performance, of course, because that's the main issue. And what I'm showing you here is uh, some performance in percentage. While well, I was comparing the code on all sorts of compilers I could find, on all sorts of machines I had access to. And so I, out, um, I always, um, well, 100% means it's the, uh, uh, what is called here, or the end. It's um, C++ implementation straightforward, uh, how you would do it non-generically. So that defines 100%. I compared the generic version against this, and you see it's basically the same speed. I mean, you have fluctuations on compilers and on uh, different machines, but it's basically as fast. Then you have the numerical recipes. It's a C library, which I, um, well, I didn't use actually the code. I wrote a better C++ version of that, but it's basically the same. And you also see it's um, it's larger numbers slower or faster? Uh, larger numbers is faster. Okay. So, wow. yeah. 200% 200 performance would be twice as fast. Exactly. And you see it's a little bit faster on average, but that was basically due to uh, the Intel compiler 11.1 on Intel machines, which were slightly faster than our implementations. I'm not sure if they did something on the numerical recipes, maybe the Intel compilers, I'm not sure. You, you can re even you re-implemented it, didn't you? Uh, yeah, but I mean, still, maybe they have something which detects. Ah, okay, this can be. I don't. I'm not sure. I just can. I observed that the eleven Intel compiler eleven was faster in this example. A question. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I may have misunderstood, but it, just, it sounded like earlier you you had a you had this uh, sort of hand coded uh, pair of for loops. And stuff, and the, was it your application of metaprogramming intended to to uh, avoid that, or yes? Oh, okay. Yes. So, do you have a? Could you uh, could you show on here like where where it would fall if you if you kept that original scheme? Like, it's was this it just oh, runtime so generic? Okay. So, RT gen means the runtime generic implementation I was showing. 
as the second implementation. And you see here the factor of two. And the factor of two is for all these compilers on all these machines. I always see the factor of two, plus minus 10%. And then, okay, for completeness, I also uh, show results on the GSL. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, did you try the numerical recipes Fortran version? No. <laughs> did, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be interesting. I don't know Fortran. A lot of people use Fortran. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I <coughs> wanted to do that. I wanted to do that since a long time, but I just don't know Fortran. And I didn't find the time to mess with it either. Okay. But you're completely right. It would be very interesting where this actually lies. I agree. Okay, so also you see that GSL is factor two slower, which is basically due to um, the, the fact that it's pre-compiled code, and so it cannot inline the right-hand side function. I think that's, that's a big issue, especially if you have the smaller system of just three variables, and you can't inline at that point, it just kills your performance. Okay, so yes. <laughs> Um, well, I know uh, the more recent your compilers are, the better it, they can optimize and handle template code. So you should um, at least use GCC 4.5, because GCC 4.3 already gives you maybe 10, 20% less. And well, as I said, you, you have always factor 2 improvement over the runtime generic implementation. I have done a second death test with a different method, uh, which has five stages, and you see the results are pretty similar. I didn't do the runtime generic implementation because I was too lazy to do it. But, yeah, it's but interesting that the numerical one has such a wider uh, variance. It's the ICC eleven. But what's on the I think bottom part, though, you know. I think it depends on Intel compiled code performs sometimes very poor on AMD processors. Yeah. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, so that's on purpose. Some people <laughs> told. <laughs> but there's, a, there's a nice blog on the web. Yeah, well, um, Intel claims that they cannot verify that with foreign processors their optimizations produce the correct results. Uh, so they're taking the safe path. Oh. Okay, so yeah, the, the variance is, comes from the Intel compiler. I can say that. I don't, I don't want to cancel that. Okay. Yes. Do you think that uh, the, that speed up of two you you're getting is just because of the loop unrolling you you're doing there, or is there are there other factors which which influence? Well, I, well, I you see, I had this slide, which basically said I don't know. Because he should have, uh, you know, code inflation because of that, right? Like the unrolled loop would be. Well, I mean, if, if everything still fits in the cache. I, mean. yeah. I think it's. Yeah, like I mean, if any anyone has, I. I think it's a vector which lives on the heap. So you make a new there, and the other one is a double, which is in the stack. Oh, okay. So here, so. yeah, in this implementation, my my parameters are on the heap. So the allocation is is outweighing. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, but it's not allocation. Huh? Maybe not allocation, but it's another place. The access, right. oh, okay. maybe. Yeah, maybe my parameters at this point get out of cache at some moment, and then. Okay, so you, you haven't done any any analysis of that. I mean, you, if you're accessing the same amount, and it's stack versus heap, I mean, it should be. You have a little yeah, boundary yeah. there, but otherwise, it should be the same. Okay. So, do I remember correctly that you didn't unroll the inner loop? Of the calculations, or no, exactly. Have you I did tried not that unroll one? the inner loop, but maybe that, maybe if I unroll the outer loop because the inner depended on the outer loop variable, now the optimizer can actually unroll the inner loop. So you could also try to unroll it with template template meta program. Well, oh, actually, uh, no, actually, yes, I do. I do unroll the inner loop also in this implementation. Okay. I yeah, it, it's. Somewhat hidden in the actual implementation, I did not. So you unroll both loops. Yes, exactly. Both I do unroll both loops. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I do. Okay. Um, was I basically at the end? I think. Uh, yeah. So 
in conclusion, so I presented the generic way to implement these kind of numerical schemes. And well, you've seen lecture two over the, the runtime generic version. And well, there's a, another um, set of schemes, schemes which are called embedded methods. You can also implement them in this way. It's actually it has been done and just not shown it. And we think that this technique can even be applied to a more numerical problems. Basically, anywhere you have some kind of stages that gets applied iteratively, you can always try to, to unroll the loop over the stages. And it's the same idea uh, for, for many numerical algorithms. OK, that's it. I thank you for your patience. I'm happy to, to answer questions. So this lets you do uh, twice as much work, right? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm not using the runtime implementation at all. It's, yeah. But yeah, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> OK, so here is the, the library uh, again, if you want to look into that. OK, any further questions, remarks? If anyone has any insights on the optimization issues, I'm happy to learn. Yes. When you talk about this at, um, with other venues that are primarily physicists or scientists of some sort, what what is their response? Their response usually is, oh, I want to do that in my numerical scheme as well. How can I get the factor of two? <laughs> and I'm telling them, well, this, you can't because you don't have a generic implementation at all. So. Um, there is a small subset of people that know template metaprogramming, but it's small. It's really small. And well, most of the times, I don't hit the audience, actually. Yeah. So, so they're excited about the speed up. Yeah. But they're not necessarily put off by the metaprogramming. No. They just want to find the intern who's going to come and do it for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK, exactly. You could get some sort of grant to uh, teach uh, metaprogramming to scientists. Uh, yeah, that would be good. I mean, it's currently changing. Uh, we have this library, and we get every second week we get an email of people who uh, would like, who are going to use it, and have some questions or something like that. So it, it's, it's getting into it. But there are also people who use Fortran, of course. And they are happy with Fortran, and they don't touch anything. So okay. Okay, then. Thanks.